We have uh, been able to produce a lot of successful business people and entrepreneurs that have been able not only develop uh, their business in Palestine, but in the region and, whole, and around the world. And uh, uh, there is, I think, a very successful group of people that we all uh, know of uh, that have pioneered uh, the, the business in Palestine, but eventually expanded their businesses to the region and beyond. Uh, I'll mention a few of them. Al Marhoum Abdi Majid Shuman, the founder of the Arab Bank, probably the ultimate entrepreneur, started uh, in Bet Hanina as a very, very small businessman, eventually get going to New York, very small uh, person with little resources, but eventually the founder of the Arab Bank, one of the largest banks in the region uh, and probably also beyond. We have other examples. Sabih al-Masri, for example, of the Palestinian of uh, world and uh, built a very successful business in Saudi Arabia and now in Jordan, Palestine, and many other places. We, although he has many other passports, but we, we are proud to call him Palestinian as well. Um, the list is, is very long. Uh, Hasib Sabah, uh, Saeed Khouri, and uh, no, I'm calling him not from the first generation. I'm calling him second generation. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't want him to put him in that category. But obviously, yes, we, we have that first generation of entrepreneurs and, and business leaders uh, that have been uh, very successful. Uh, but we also have a current generation of very successful business people. And yes, Zahi Khouri is one of them. Maher Qaddura is another. Uh, Mr. Anab Tawi is a third one. We have many of them in this room, but also beyond. I mean, we, we have really a lot to, to be proud of uh, in terms of our ability to, to, to build companies and businesses and successful ones. Uh, I think the objective of, of this session is to not so much talk about what we have done in the past, but uh, what we would like to do in the future. We believe that the current Palestinian economy uh, require a major transformation that will take it from being dependent on public sector and donor assistance into uh, an economy that's uh, led by private sector activity. Uh, and that obviously require uh, development and nurturing of uh, the new generation of leaders and entrepreneurs uh, in Palestine. Uh, just to give you a flavor of what's happening today, I will mention a uh, few success stories that we're able to uh, make happen despite the difficulties. Uh, believe it or not, we have a very prospering Palestine stock exchange, which have more than 40 listed companies. Uh, most of them average age of five to 10 years, but have done very well over the last 10 to 15 years despite what happened uh, in the region with several wars in the region, but also the financial crisis later on. And in that list of companies listed in the stock exchange, there are very good success stories, including a company like Paltel, the first telecom company in Palestine, Badiko, a major investment company, and many others. But among the companies that we also proud ourselves with is uh, several companies in the pharmace pharmaceutical business, which I think among uh, the most competitive in the region, they are not only able to produce uh, products that they can sell locally, but also beyond that into the region. They have been able to sell their products to, in countries like Algeria, in countries like Saudi Arabia, but also now in Europe. So we're talking about producers of products at international level. Uh, at uh, Palestine Investment Fund, where I work, uh, over the last three years, we were able to create five champion companies in different sectors. Um, Wataniya Mobile is the second mobile company in partnership with Qtel. It was launched about a year ago. Yesterday, the IPO for the company started. 
And uh, by, by the time the IPO is over, the company would have a capitalization of about $335 million. Uh, a success story by any standard. A second leading company that we're able to establish over the last few years is uh, an, a Rihan company, which is a housing development company that aims at building about 30,000 housing units on commercial terms and sell them to the public. Uh, we have already started the development of two neighborhoods, one called the Rihan and another called the Jinan, and we plan to continue to, to, uh, to implement this, uh, this uh, very ambitious affordable housing program. Uh, to support the housing program, we established a third company, a mortgage finance company, uh, $500 million mortgage, mortgage finance company in Palestine in partnership with IFC, from the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, uh, with OPEC from the United States, two local banks, Bank of Palestine and Cairo Amman Bank, in addition to Bank of Palestine. Last but not least, we were also able to put together a, a very ambitious program to support the SME sector. Uh, we have a loan guarantee program that's providing loan guarantees to banks that are providing loans for SMEs. The program has already disp dispersed more than $64 million over the last 18 months or so to about 300 different businesses. Uh, we believe that more than 5,000 new jobs were created through this program so far. And to supplement that program, we launched recently the new private equity fund for SMEs with Abraj Capital. The fund is, uh, will be a $50 million fund. PIF has put the first $10 million. Abraj put $5 million of their own money. Bank of Palestine joined and uh, put $5 million. And several other investors also uh, are now part of this fund. We hope to be able to do the first closing of a minimum of $30 million in the coming few weeks. We believe that uh, this fund, along with the loan guarantee program for SMEs, will have a transformational effect on the SME sector. Now, the SME sector for us is the largest part of the economy and the biggest source of jobs in the private sector. 95% more or more of our companies are SMEs. So this is really, we're talking about a, a big part of, of the economy. So what I have just uh, mentioned is a, is a list of, uh, of, of activities and companies that are not only large by any standard, but also have a Palestinian partner in addition to several uh, regional and international partners. We are proud to call Abraj our partner. We're proud to call QTEL our partner. We're proud to call IFC our partner. We're proud to call OPEC as our partner. So I think we have been able to not only establish successful companies, but also attract regional uh, and international investors into Palestine. This is to say that Palestine, as I've started, is not just a country that has obviously a, a political conflict with an occupation, but also a, a promising country with a promising economy that we're determined to build uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with the support of friends and partners like yourselves. Uh, what I'm going to uh, say at the end, before I, I turn it over to, to my colleagues in the panel, is that we believe that in order to help create the, th the third generation of entrepreneurs in Palestine, uh, a center for entrepreneurship would be a good vehicle to help us achieve that objective. A center that will become a symbol or an icon or an address for entrepreneurs, but also provide support to in for entrepreneurs to create, to develop ideas, but also more importantly, to implement these ideas and, and turn them into into businesses. Uh, I'm not talking about a, a funding mechanism here. We're talking about uh, an, a center that will help entrepreneurs, as I mentioned, develop their ideas, at, uh, raise money, and secure funding, but also implement the ideas through possibly some handholding, probably through some uh, training and talent development. Uh, uh, and we believe that this will have a, a major impact on increasing the number of entrepreneurs and create the new generation of, uh, of business people in Palestine that can help us uh, to uh, direct our attention to economic development uh, in, 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 the, in the current phase 
and play an important role in establishing Palestine as an independent country, but more importantly, in a, in a, in a, based on an economy that's sustainable and, and private sector-led uh, kind, of, uh, uh, like, like kind of country. So with this introduction, I would like now to uh, ask uh, my colleagues in the panel, um, Steve, Dr. Sabri, and Marwan Tarazi, who come from different backgrounds and, and, and interests, to speak to this point and uh, hopefully help me make the point, uh, make the case that uh, a center of entrepreneurship in Palestine would play a positive role in helping us achieving our objective in a more uh, uh, sustainable economy. Steve? Thanks, Dr. Mustafa. I'm Steve Garrow. I'm CEO of Rushmore Associates. I'm from New York, and I thank the panel for keeping this in English for me today. Uh, my, my background business-wise is I've started a couple of institutional broker-dealers, an asset management firm, a, a software company, and a research company. On the entrepreneurial nonprofit side, the work that I've done in New York is I, I spend a lot of time with NYU. New York University has a, a business plan competition in which we nurture entrepreneurs through the process, starting with 400 companies in September all the way till May uh, with mentoring and coaching and judging. I also help run a, uh, a nonprofit in New York called Webo. It's called we, uh, stands for Workshops in Business Opportunities, and it's a it's an organization that helps uh, entrepreneurs in low-income communities get education. This, this is people in their 30s and their 40s and their 50s trying to grow and start new businesses in tough situations, and there can be some parallels here. Uh, I, I think we all agree in our discussions with the foundation of the center that for one of these centers to succeed, as I've seen a couple in the past in New York succeed, it takes more than just uh, the capital uh, that Dr. Mustafa mentioned. It takes more than the partnerships that he mentioned, which are incredibly valuable. But really, for, for entrepreneurs to succeed in any kind of setting, in any environment, it takes a whole community. It takes the, it takes the capital to set up a center. It takes educational. It takes mentoring. It takes advising. Uh, it takes resources to help give support to that, that entrepreneurial that, that's, trying to, that's trying to set up and to grow. And I think that the center is being geared to have that type of an impact on, on the ground in Palestine. I also run a, a, a nonprofit scholarship organization for Palestinian high school students studying in the States, and that gets me on the ground quite often in Palestine. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Sabri Saidam. I have uh, special interest in ICT. I also advise the president on uh, ICT. And um, I would say with all honesty that uh, the discussion today has been, uh, to me, has been based on a recent study that has showed that you have to get a certain age, about 40, when you start your own business, according to that study. And that 75% uh, of the yes, statistics showed that um, it's not important what you know, it's important who you know. And that's presumably the case in the third world. Through our um, new endeavor with the Center of uh, Entrepreneurship, the idea is to nurture a Palestinian society that's based on ideas that are creative, that can turn into business success stories, whereby we can see a different life for the Palestinians. I heard earlier Fadi Gandur talk about conflict and how people somehow in conflict torn communities, they just give up. And people from the outside look and see that this is a conflict torn community, why should I be interested? I think a, a, a donor-based community is the community that should evolve itself into adopting entrepreneurship in, in a much more um, speedy approach and should entertain the idea of improving even women inclusion, and that's most important in uh, the entrepreneurship idea, and uh, entrepreneurship world. And I have to say that uh, Mohammed uh, Mustafa had mentioned uh, the challenges that Palestinians face. And maybe the one side of Palestine you, you often see is politics, and indeed conflict. But if you combine conflict and poverty, and you allow this to be the challenging platform on which you stand to create a success story and you succeed, I think that's the ultimate um, uh, partner we would want to work with and the ultimate success story that one would like to be associated with. That's why we say to our friends when they come and visit, we say if you succeed in Palestine, you succeed everywhere. You have people who are interested, 
people who are engaged and people who have the passion and people who are eager for change. And with that comes the recipe of success. Let me just uh, um, bring up a, um, a story of success that I think should be nurtured. And I find the center of entrepreneurship is the platform to accommodate that story. And it is a story that comes, sorry again, from the word of conflict, but it is a story that's touched my heart, and I'm sure it will touch your hearts. You remember that there was a famous, uh, I like to stand up when I speak, so just to make life easy. I say every politician loves a microphone. I love the microphone, and I love standing, so. To, in, what I want to say is that you remember Al Jazeera footage on a Palestinian standing by the village of Nalin. Those of you who don't know Nalin, Nalin is one of the villages now uh, protesting on a weekly basis. The Israeli wall, what I call the wall of shame, is building along the West Bank. That girl has established a group, and uh, the group is so successful, they have their own dog. I'll give you the name of the group. She came about a day before I left Ramallah. In fact, a few hours, I would say, before I left Ramallah to this meeting. And she said to me, I'm interested in establishing my own business. And my own business is to capitalize on the wealth of the Palestinian knowledge we have amongst youth. So we establish our own media group. Now, I have to say that uh, I was touched by the story because by the time she decided to give me the, I want to show you something. She's tried twice to come to Ramallah, it's not easy. And she said, uh, I've written something that I want to give you. And then uh, she's been walking for a while, but it's interesting when she wanted to give me the document, she, has a no she had a nose bleeding. And I kept the document as is. I brought it with me so to show you the level of adamance people have. She was bleeding, but she insisted to continue the meeting. And I asked her to leave the room and go and see a medic but she wanted to continue the discussion. She felt this is an important issue that I should bring to your attention. A Palestinian living in misery yet is so determined to establish a new life through the power of youth. And she said to me, I have three things for you. She has this brochure or brochure that's been uh, developed by the, the Ford Foundation and funded by the Europeans. She's been part of a team that has, uh, had, uh, that has produced several short movies. And she said, I have two films, four minutes each. Can you help me become a successful entrepreneur? And I thought this is a prime story of how people can turn and utilize <coughs> the challenges they face in life to become a success story. So I truly believe wholeheartedly that the center of entrepreneurship should help Salam Kanaan and others to become new emerging success stories. Thank you very much, uh, Sabri. Marwan? I'm not a politician, but I want to stand up. Marwan <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tarazi, uh, I work at Birzeit University. Um, we, I work at the Center for Continuing Education. Our center um, is, is an institutional capacity unit arm within the university. We work with communities. We work in uh, adult education and lifelong learning. We work in uh, basically areas related to education and, and development. Um, one of the things that we notice, you know, when you work in development in Palestine, and, and this is going to be my angle, I'm going to look at why such a center would be important from a developmental perspective. Once you work in development, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of interest in Palestine. I mean, as, as a lot of you may know, we are the highest recipient of aid per capita in the world you know, Palestinians. So we have a lot of projects, you know, different funders and different donors, and everybody wants to do uh, business development, and ev everybody wants to do uh, venture capital, and everybody wants to, you know, provide loans and training and, and IT. And the problem is, so we have a lot of those assets available from the international community and from the donor community, and everybody's looking for a quick win. Okay, so we come, all right, so we want to develop this, let's do a training program, and we expect to do this training program, and then tomorrow we're going to have a business startup. And of course, this doesn't happen. I mean, I'm sure we've been here 
enough and everybody knows enough that getting from a point of acquiring some knowledge to getting to a point to producing knowledge and then becoming confident enough to start developing a business, you have a, a, a long way to go. Now, the problem is a lot of development, this is how a lot of this development takes place. It's just like fragmented, it's all over the place and it's not coordinated. And yet, we, we know that there are a lot of opportunities out there. I mean, look at the opportunities. I mean, the, 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 the example that somebody just gave is an important one. I mean, people, you have a lot of people that are living under occupation. They've been living under occupation for a long time. And it's difficult, you know, people develop resilience. You want to live, you want to survive, you want to have a normal life. I mean, it's not nice to live under occupation, so people want to find ways out. So there's an enormous amount of energy sitting there, and people have this energy that needs to be directed and to be improved and turned into a positive focus. So one of the key issues that such a center, a program like this one, along these lines would do, would work with a different stakeholders, different uh, uh, people, players, trying to improve the status of education becomes uh, a coordinating sort of body plus a technical support arm. So we try to use a lot of the existing capitals and I've spoken one about capitals that include um, external funding and support being coming down to the country but there's also, let's not forget, that there's a lot of com you know, knowledge and capital assets within the community itself. There's a lot of educated people. You go to villages and communities, you find them with, there's a very high level of university graduates sitting in villages and communities, and a lot of them are idle. Can we make use of those? Yes, I mean, I mean, it just makes sense. Of course we can make use of those, but the question is how and what does it take? So for us sitting from somewhere like, you know, the center from our work when we're doing work with the communities, very often it has been very frustrating. You see these things around and you want to do something about it, but, but you're having difficulties putting things uh, uh, together, putting the different pieces of the puzzle together. Will the center do that? This is an important component in that this center will be looking into. How will we get the stakeholders? How will we get different people to sit and conceptualize Okay, there's a lot of ideas, there's a lot of work in agriculture, there's a lot of work in knowledge work, in IT, et cetera, that needs to be developed. But somebody has to sit and conceptualize the larger picture, put people together, get ideas, and then drive them forward. Such a center would, would help a lot with that. I would like also to make reference, I mean, I mean just a small example of a, a sector that's with enormous potential that's not being uh, tapped into, and that is tourism. I mean, after all, whether we like it or not, whether under conflict or not, we are the holy land, irrespective of how holy you think it is or not these days. But it is, and it's a major tourism destination. And today, tourism just goes to very specific areas. You know, they go to visit the main sites, uh, and, and that's it, you know. And so there's a lot of room for work on tourism, but to work on tourism, to create alternative tourism addressing, targeting, for example, the, um, the Palestinian uh, villages and towns, ecotourism, uh, this needs some, some thinking, some development. And again, these are ideas, something to be done here. Um, I would also like to um, point out, make, make reference to another point. Um, we also know, an important point, is that to, to develop business and entrepreneurship, there's a lot of demand and work that needs to be done at the educational level, at educational uh, institutions. And education, uh, getting young people um, from, you know, entrepreneurship is typically something that you do not necessarily go take a course in entrepreneurship and you become an entrepreneur. It's something that you have to create. It's, it's an attitude. It's, it's, it's an attitude that you need to work on when you're working with, with kids, when you're working with university students. So it's something you need to develop. Now, there are a lot of, again, as I said, we are development galore. So there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of entrepreneurship programs for schools, for universities that come along the lines. The problem is people come and bring those little programs, put them in. When the funding is finished, everything goes away. The work is, done at the, at, is not done at an institutional level, it's not uh, organized. Now, one of the 
issues that such a center would look at. It would act as a lobby group, as a, uh, it would act as, as a, a, a policy group that would advise and would try to support whether universities, whether schools, educational centers, to start thinking about how can you mainstream entrepreneurship into the educational program. Again, remember what I'm saying here, it's not, we will, the, the center will not go out and do this kind of work. It's not part of their scope, but they will do, try to support policies and, and decisions that will influence this overall uh, environment. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like now to hear from you and your reaction to some of what was said uh, in this session so far. And I would like to call upon uh, Zahi Khouri to start the discussion by telling us what he thinks. Well, you put me here on the spot, Mohammed, but it's okay. Uh, it's okay. Uh, I think in terms of uh, uh, Palestine and entrepreneurship in Palestine, it's, 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 it's very much a personal matter. When people ask me why am I investing in Palestine, well, there are a number of reasons. One, I come from there. But more important, I think conflict areas always present big opportunities, actually, not small opportunities. Uh, and uh, for a global investor, I remember one of these years when I lived in New York, the number one performer on the stock exchanges worldwide of Morgan Stanley Exchange was Gabon. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but I think uh, Dr. Mustafa mentioned a number of success stories. And, uh, and there is a mission in investing in Palestine, a mission of creating job. There is a, a much bigger also mission is creating stability. There is also a mission for the free world, actually, to solve this issue, this major, major conflict, which is impacting the whole area. But I think there are opportunities, there are challenges. One of the points which wasn't mentioned here, but the level of literacy, when you talk about the Middle East, maybe Palestine would rank as number one. And, and that's also quite unique. When you look at me as an employer in Palestine with uh, maybe impacting the lives of 15,000 people when I look at the, our universe in terms of business, uh, it's amazing to notice that, uh, that in a company which directly employs <coughs> 350 people, they're all of one nationality. There isn't a single company in the Middle East, even neighboring countries, where there is only one nationality, and that presents a certain harmony at the working place, and uh, which is, I remember my days in Saudi Arabia, the, we had in the company 32 nationalities. I mean, it's amazing, the turnover, uh, just to, to get a unified culture working towards, uh, I mean, the goals of the, the shareholders was a major challenge. That doesn't exist. That's a uniqueness also in the, in the Palestinian market. And I can go on and on, but I want to leave. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody? Yes, please. Hi, Tofik Rahim, um, currently at the Dubai School of Government. I was looking at part of this issue for, for a couple of weeks and met with some of the people here. Uh, I guess my question is more oriented. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, my question is uh, and comment is more oriented towards what we can do uh, because you know you have, for example, at five universities these Anira ICT centers. You have something like PICT. You have the fifty million dollar fund being done with PIF and Abraj. Uh, you have great success stories like NBC that invests in its employees as. 350 employees, 10 indirect employees for each of those. So you have all these little ingredients, Palestinians are literate, etc. What's the next step? I mean, because, you know, when there's a huge difficulty, I mean, I think NBC uh, exports to Iraq and Jordan, etc. Uh, but most companies, they can't export. There's severe restrictions. The move and pick just set up, for example, 
they uh, you know ordered their deep freezer whatnot and the israelis took out uh, the engine or, or the motor for it and so now they have this huge freezer and they had to go into the market and they're looking for for that to run so there are these huge challenges i mean in palestine where entrepreneurship is more difficult than let's say in jordan um so what that means is you need a larger play where you're really bringing in people together so if you want to make palestine a center for outsourcing it can't just be you know um uh, Exalt and GCCI and a couple companies in the corner. I mean, this is a very comprehensive initiative. So we have a lot of interesting people in the room, uh, people who are wealthy, associated with wealth, uh, people who like to stand up everything. What ideas can we come up with, I mean, here, to really move, you know, m you know push the needle, really change uh, uh, what's going on there, not, you know, small steps, etc. What's a big idea that really we could uh, work on? to all of you. Anybody like to say something? Maher, since there is no volunteers, I'm going to volunteer some people. You know, I like the idea of SMEs okay. to be realistic. Right. Uh, they are, uh, the idea of creating, I'll give you an example, if the statistic is, statistics is true. In Canada, 53% of people employed, they employed in uh, companies less than four people. Mm. Maybe th this is, we need to be practical in approaching this. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, uh, the center for example, mm. it has to be focused on specific sectors that we can make an impact. Our training, I mean, uh, to come in and train um, general entrepreneurship or we need to be very specific. To be one sector or a series of sectors that we believe they are of, imp of importance to us. Mm -hmm. And we have specific programs for each to get startups, generate ideas, uh, uh, make incubators very effective, like what, what's happening in Jordan right now, uh, grassroots stuff, uh, get the private sector to own some of these incubators, not donor money. Uh, let the donor money go somewhere else. I mean, we need uh, private sector people who have money to become partners in this incubator and these companies. And they need to say, we want to produce 50 companies in two years out of this. Mm. Like what I'm doing at Medan. I, I, want to, I want to process in two to three years 70 to 80 companies in Jordan. I know there's a challenge of deal flow. Right? But this is what we need to work on. We need to work on the grassroots. Mm -hmm. and to get The other issue that we have is uh, the, 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 the universities. I mean, uh, we need, because we cannot create enough jobs for these young people. We need to encourage them to get out of, mm -hmm. when they finish university, what kind of ideas they have. We need to have youth programs for them to start up their business. Not everything we have should be around our own IT. I mean, uh, vocational incubators. I mean, I want to, uh, like, we can have uh, incubators for carpenters, uh, Haddad, who, uh, all of this, that we can provide him with uh, a, a workshop to start his own business. So, because I have a sense that everything, when we think of incubation, we think of IT and internet. We can have, we need to be relevant. relevant I mean, do we have to be relevant to our uh, situation there so we can generate the, we have to gen focus on generating jobs. This is uh, the focus of it. Thanks, I think to, to kind of address the last two points a bit if I could, I, I, think, I think there will be some big ideas. I think, the, I think the point of the center is it'll be an organic, uh, an organic body to start. It'll, it'll morph, it'll change based on what we see some of the needs. And I think the sun will be reaching out to the community uh, as this thing starts growing and building and gets some traction on the ground to say, help us with the small ideas first and then the medium-sized ideas. And then the big ideas will come. I think it's important to kind of get those small ideas first. Uh, I think those big ideas will come out. But I think the center is, should be looked at also as a, as a place to, to almost guarantee more success. Uh, two centers I work with in New York, one in the Bronx and one in Harlem, uh, battle zones in their own rights, not the same as Palestine, but battle zones, uh, where, where the organization that I'm with goes, uh, the success rate of companies after five years, that they're still alive and still in business, is about 
versus the typical average national as well as in the Bronx and Harlem of about 20%. So if, if we start 100 companies in Palestine and 54 last five years and are th thriving and surviving versus 20, versus 20 that would have survived otherwise without some support from the community in the center, that makes a big impact that 34 companies that wouldn't have existed without the support of the center and the community and the, and the big ideas that will hopefully come out and be a big employer ultimately. Uh, I, sure. Um, I'm not going to stand up, so maybe I'll divorce the microphone soon as well. I just uh, want to say that um, I listened quite carefully to what Fawaz Zabi had to say earlier about the internet turning the world into a global village. And uh, I think we should, as Palestinians, utilize the internet. And I believe in what Maher says. We have to be realistic. We have to be consistent and systematic. I totally respect that. And we should do more and brag less. I, I believe in that policy. But I also, being biased to the world of ICT, I honestly believe that we in the ICT community can do a lot for Palestine. It is one of the sectors. Uh, Dr. Mustafa uh, alluded to some other sectors that we can also help in. But I honestly believe that, uh, for example, software industry, a proper software industry in Palestine, capitalizing on the knowledge and wealth of others and building on the success stories that we have, I think will help us in, in some way bypass the obstacles and overcome the challenges, one of which is the checkpoints that we have, the transfer of goods, the need for expertise to come from outside. We can replace all this through the software industry that doesn't need checkpoints that doesn't need raw material and can build on the expertise of others through uh, vibrant and online connectivity. And the secret in all this are two things, in my opinion. One is partnership. It's most important to build and connect, build bridges and connect with the international community and connect with the region. Dr. Mustafa mentioned one of the countries in the region. I'm not going to mention that specific country. But he said in recent meetings, he had felt that that country is no longer benchmarking its work with, with other regional countries. It's going beyond. It's now saying, you know, it's benchmarking with other international countries. I think we should set the standards high. Sometimes I say that we need to be the X country. We need to be, for example, the Angola of the Middle East. I'm not going to mention a country. Some young uh, men and women in Palestine say, no, we want to be the Germany of uh, Ambition is most important, but also ambition would have to be also consistent with, with the advice of partners that we need to. The second issue, and I will finish here, is the issue of sustainability, which is most important. We often have support from people around the world, from donor community, but the issue of sustainability is always absent. We have to remain sustainable. And I say our slogan in Palestine is not is, should be built on the Chinese or whatever country that uh, saying came from that we should not give a person a fish, but rather teach him or her how to fish. Yes, please. Gentlemen, um, all that you've discussed today is, is, is um, aimed at grassroots empowerment within of the Palestinian territories. Um, are there any plans in the offing to mobilize the relatively well-settled diaspora in other countries, the Palestinian diaspora that does quite possibly have the capital and also the political wherewithal and the sense of attachment um, to um, perhaps either be an angel to form a network of angel investors or some sort of incubation fund or um, any such support or financial investment mechanism? Is there anything like that in the works at all? I think there's one more. Hello. Yes. Basically, you know, I think the problem with the Palestinians abroad and Palestinians in, you know, West Bank and Gaza is that there's no link. And you, you mentioned the internet. I mean, we need to use this technology to reach the entrepreneurs, even on a small level in Gaza and West Bank, and support them. I mean, if, for example, you go to Kiva.org, an American lead, an entrepreneur basically, who launched Kiva.org that links funds via the internet to, entrep to small entrepreneurs around the, the world. And she even had access to Gaza and the West Bank, Lebanon, Iraq, just go to her uh, profile. And basically, what she does is she, you know, 
a baker wants a thousand dollars to start a bakery and then she links them with people who donate the funds via the internet and that allows this baker in West Bank in Gaza to then start the bakery and hire four or five people hire his brother and so forth and then maybe then move to uh, you know another city in the West Bank bottom line is you know we do not when we live abroad we don't have that it, you know, exchange with who are the entrepreneurs who we can help. And it shouldn't be we want to help only, you know, the ones who have the money and the great idea. No, because, I mean, a lot of Palestinians are living way below the poverty line. So we should be trying to help on a very micro level where the baker, the blacksmith, uh, the teacher, the educator, and so forth. What I propose is that we, you know, we come up with one internet site that essentially has, all it will need in the West Bank Gaza is a couple of field operators, people who go to the entrepreneurs, see if they have a viable business. It could be as simple as starting a bakery or starting you know, an agricultural center or what have you, and, or a software program, programmer, and basically put their photo and their information on the site and what what is the capital that they need? Could be a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, and then link them to people who will be on the site from out, outside Palestine who will eventually give, fund this. You know, and this will could have a major dominoes effect in helping small businesses across Palestine to grow. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we have to wrap up. I guess we have only a couple of minutes to close this session, but um, let me first thank you all for being here and for giving us uh, f a very good feedback that uh, definitely will help us improve uh, the idea further. Uh, obviously, uh, this is not targeted at Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza. This is not uh, a purely Palestinian initiative. What we hope to do actually is to not only get the Palestinian uh, diaspora interested, but hopefully friends from around the world in the region and outside the region to be part of this, because we believe at the, at the end of the day that, that uh, there are so many people, partners and, and friends, uh, are, are interested in, 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 uh, uh, in, in economic development of Palestine, and they would like to have the opportunity to, to help in any way possible. So this is an opportunity for all. And yes, of course, the, the idea here is, is starting with you know, small projects, small ideas, and help the owners, the developers, the creators of these ideas to develop uh, these ideas further and translate them into successful businesses. We believe that the center will play an important role in providing some kind of hand-holding for these entrepreneurs and putting the entrepreneurs uh, on a path that would lead to uh, uh, securing financing from uh, banks that will lend money, microfinance institutions that already, some of them already exist, but also private equity funds like the one we just launched with, with Abraj. So, but we still believe that the money is not the only problem here. We believe that the entrepreneurs need help to develop their ideas further and bring things to a point where a bank would consider a loan and a fund would consider an investment. And that's we hope will be one of the critical roles of, uh, of the center we're talking about. But uh, thank you again. We'll continue, hopefully, the discussion through, perhaps through WAMDA uh, and, and the website. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll uh, be able to hear from you. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.